Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think some people are still coming in, but we will uh, get started. Um, I am Mary Eintema, the president and CEO of World Boston, and I welcome you to today's program, a discussion with Fulbright scholars, the legacies of two New England trailblazers. Uh, and welcome to our speakers, Hyria and Mushumi, and to our moderator, our friend Jim Moore. Um, you'll hear more about them in a moment. I just wanted to mention that, uh, as some of you know, World Boston is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with a special mission of fostering international engagement and global cooperation. Uh, this mission is particularly important during this truly global time of pandemic, even as we are practicing social distancing. Uh, today's event is part of our new series called International Engagement in a Time of Isolation, which is designed as part of our ongoing citizen diplomacy work. Uh, and it, the series focuses on people to people contact and the human face of the international dynamics shaping our lives. Uh, by the way, we have another great virtual program uh, coming up on the lighter side. This Thursday evening will be the first of our four weekly global trivia nights. Uh, so we hope you'll join in on that. And next Tuesday, uh, May 26, we'll be back with a lunchtime culinary diplomacy webinar featuring, featuring India. Uh, we'll have more info about both of those upcoming events at the end of this program. <clears throat> and of course, uh, it's on our website, worldboston.org. Uh, so as you can see, we are inviting you to join us in a range of virtual activities designed to keep us all internationally engaged. Uh, you can learn more about World Boston at worldboston.org, and I hope you'll join us. And if you can, that you'll support us too. Um, everyone but the speakers will be muted. Um, if you want to see, let's see what slide. Yes, okay, we're on our tech slide. Um, everybody knows by now about uh, gallery view. I do want to point out um, on this slide how we're doing questions. Uh, we do have a Q&A box to submit questions in writing, uh, but of course we'd love it if you would raise your hand and then we can see and hear you. Um, uh, as you ask your question, uh, we're not using the uh, chat function um, on for questions, so bear that in mind. And um, don't forget to turn off your phone. I have done that before. All right, so now I will hand over our proceedings to my colleague, Josh Bruno, who is our manager for Citizen Diplomacy Programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Mary said, I have the pleasure of welcoming you. Um, sorry, welcoming you to this educational event focusing on the Fulbright Visiting Scholars Program and the legacies of two New England trailblazers, Emily Dickinson and Frederick Law Olmsted. First, I'd like to acknowledge our presenters currently living here in Massachusetts, Dr. Hyria Espatunke from Turkey, who is based at Harvard University uh, in Cambridge, and Dr. Musumi Banerjee from India, who is based in Amherst College in Amherst. It's been a pleasure hosting them at the Fulbright Enrichment events. Over the last couple of weeks, we have even held our own Coffee Friday events, where the scholars meet for an informal chat and check-in to stay connected during this time of isolation. Hyrie and Misumi are always there starting the conversations with other scholars. Today, we're thrilled that they've decided to take a break from their final projects in book writing to join us. I know we have a few folks attending from the International Institute of Education in DC, who oversee the entire enrichment program for the Fulbright Visiting Scholars in four anchor cities, Boston, New York, Northern California, and Southern California. Thank you for joining us today. We also have with us our partners from Suffolk University. We want to give a special shout out to Mr. Michael Malahi, as well as staff from the President's Office who graciously lend us their space, their time, and their effort to help us implement Fulbright-related activities. Finally, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel's moderator, Jim Moore. Jim Moore served as a Foreign Service Officer with the US State Department for over 30 years. During his career as a diplomat, he was posted to American embassies and consulates in nine countries. In his most recent positions, Jim served as Chief of Mission to the Dutch Caribbean, De uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy in South and Central Asia, and Deputy Chief of Mission to Sri Lanka. Throughout his Foreign Service career, 
Jim was committed to building ties between the people of the United States and the people of other nations. He's passionate about the value of international education exchange. In Turkey, he was chairman of the U.S. Turkey Fulbright Commission. He also served on the boards of, Internet, of the binational Fulbright Commissions in Argentina, Ecuador, and Sri Lanka. Jim currently works with World Boston as coordinator of the enrichment program for Fulbright visiting scholars from other countries who are based in the uh, greater Boston area. The Fulbright enrichment program is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and administered by the Institute of International Education. Now, uh, once I turn Jim's camera on, I'll hand the reins to him. Um, he will moderate the panel discussion. Afterwards, we'll open it up for 10 minutes of questions. Jim, if you just give me one second, um, I'll turn on your video. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There's Jim. All right. All right. Josh, um, thank you very much. And many thanks as well to our two wonderful speaking, uh, um, wonderful speakers for joining us today. Um, to start, I'd like to share with our audience a quick introduction to the Fulbright Visiting Scholars Program. Fulbright Program was established shortly after World War II by Senator J. William Fulbright with the goal of promoting intercultural, intercultural relations between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. It remains today one of the largest and most prestigious educational exchange programs in the world. To date, Fulbright alumni have subsequently been awarded an impressive 60 Nobel Prizes and 86 Pulitzer Prizes. One of the several categories of Fulbright grantees is visiting scholars who conduct research and or lecturing. As many as 100 Fulbright visiting scholars from other countries are placed each year in the greater Boston area. To supplement their, their teaching and their research, World Boston organizes enrichment activities that are designed to introduce the Fulbright Visiting Scholars and their family members to culturally and historically significant aspects of New England. We have a terrific group of Fulbright Visiting Scholars this year, and it's an honor for me to introduce two of them to you so that you can learn about their research and, and also hear their, their insights into two American trailblazers from the 19th century. Landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted and poet Emily Dickinson. Our guests today, as noted, are from India and Turkey, two of the countries in which I've been very pri pri privileged to serve. Ha Haria Esbam Tunje is a professor of architecture, land, of landscape architecture at the Istanbul Technical University and is currently a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Hairi Ray is, Hi, Hairi Ray is the um, founding director of Habitat, Ecology and Technology and an award-winning landscape uh, architecture and urban design firm based in Istanbul. Her broad range, is, her broad, broad range of interests is, are driven by the challenges faced by rapidly growing cities in the developing world. Leader in her field, Dr. Eshpa Tunje has authored over 150 articles uh, for scientific journals and other professional publications and has given also keynote speeches and led workshops around the world. Dr. Eshba Tunje earned her doctoral de degree here in the United States in environmental design and planning from Arizona State University and a master's degree in landscape, uh, landscape architecture from the University of Arizona. 
Harye is an active member of the Turkish Landscape Architects Association and is also from um, 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 a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Dr. Mushimi Banerjee teaches literature at the English and Foreign Languages University at its Shillong campus in beautiful northeastern India. As a Fulbright visiting scholar, she is pursuing her post postdoc research on Emily Dickinson and is associated with Amherst College. Dr. Banerjee's areas of research are philosophy and women's writing, particularly voices of women poets who, who have heretofore uh, been considered to be on the margins of um, literary writing. In addition to literature, Dr. Banerjee is also a passionate teacher of contemporary theater, as well as a singer and music enthusiast. She loves to engage uh, in deliberations on humanistic discourses, and in particular, about Emily Dickinson. Dr. Banerjee is the author of three books on aspects of American, sorry, of Indian, British, and American literature. In addition, Mushumi is currently working on two book length projects, one of which explores the underlying philosophy of, of Emily Dickinson's poetry. Mushumi and Hai Reye, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Espa Tungje uh, and then move after that to Dr. Banerjee. Hi, Riyaye. You live in Istanbul, one of truly the most vibrant cities in the world and one that is so rich in its history. How would you describe your experience here in Boston and in Cambridge? Hi, Jim. Thank you very much. It's wonderful being here. Actually, there are some similarities between Boston and Istanbul, uh, such as vivid historical image, the presence of sea, ocean, and rivers shaping the urban matrix, as well as the vibrant urban context of the 21st century. However, compared to Boston, Istanbul is much denser in dealing with rapid urbanization and uncontrolled migration from the rural areas, as well as from the Middle East which has been causing challenges in terms of provision of public services and green space. Uh, Boston is very fortunate in terms of green infrastructure. It's mainly due to the foresighted administrations that had invested in establishing large open spaces, such as the Emerald Necklace, designed by great landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted in the 19th century. Therefore, as a landscape architect teaching and practicing in Istanbul, being close to the world-renowned heritage green spaces of Boston is inspiring for me. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, Harie. And what a happy coincidence um, that very first Fulbright um, in enrichment event of this academic year was a uh, tour in October of the parks of the um, um, of the Emerald Necklace. Um, and that's that's where we met you. Right. So, so, to continue, could you could you speak next uh, to us about the focus of your research here and some of the insights you have gained into environmental design and planning during your Fulbright year? Sure. Um, my research at Harvard University deals with uh, uh, sustainable river corridor design for future cities. Urban river corridors are under pressure of urban expansion and outcomes of climate change, not only here or Turkey, but all over the world. Therefore, I look at the future of these critical socio-ecological corridors from sustainability, innovation, climate change, and well-being point of view. More specifically, I focus on the case of Charles River uh, while I am here in Boston. I was very impressed by the utilization of the Charles Corridor for recreational activities. The river has good potential in terms of well-being and sustainability. But on the other side, the river corridor management currently lacks innovative solutions to monitor landscape performance, biodiversity, 
uh, or the carrying capacity. Uh, implementation of the new sensor technologies and artificial intelligence can be the next step to make these rivers much smarter. Uh, also, the sea level rise and other issues coming with climate change should be at the focus of future planning in Boston. Um, although there are some landscape architecture firms such as Reed and Hildebrand, Stoss, Scape, and many more that I'm probably missing right now, but they are making a great effort to mitigate some of these issues. The impact will be clear after the implementation of their projects, uh, but I, I feel very privileged to meet with all these uh, wonderful colleagues at Harvard, so it's a wonderful experience for me. I'm sure it's a wonderful experience for Harvard to have you there as well, Irene. Um, I, I wanted to move on and ask about um, about what do you see in in Olmsted's or as Olmsted's uh, most important contribution to the practice of uh, urban design, and what draws you um, to his work and and might some of Olmsted's practices uh, be relevant uh, in Turkey? Sure. Well, Frederick Law Olmsted is a pioneer in landscape architecture uh, all over the world, and especially American landscape architecture. He lived between 1822 and 1903, somewhat the same period as Emily Dickinson, and, and they, they are pet. I don't know if, if it has ever crossed, but uh, they are much more into the botany, and that's uh, what, what I get to learn from that Emily Dickinson, too. His time was a period of transition from farming communities to industrialized cities. In spite of all the unprecedented and uncontrolled urban growth, Olmsted saw great potential in this time of prosperity if people were to call creative enough to seize the opportunity. He kept this positive attitude alive throughout all his career. He was always positive and seeing the things in a better way. Olmsted's experiences in England profoundly influenced his practice in the US. He got his inspirations from the English gardener, Capability Browns landscapes in which sweeping meadows, clumps, and belts of native trees, sheets of impounded water, and winding drives were the elements that shaped the aesthetics and image of the nature of an urbanizing and industrializing world. Subsequently, Olmsted sought to create compositions of more significant landscape effects, devoid of elaborate flower gardens or other distractions from the fundamental experience of scenery. So he was very much fond of the scenery. Olmsted was influenced by continued progress in contemporary natural sciences, especially by the works of geologists Louis Agassiz and Nathaniel Scheller at Harvard University. Uh, Olmsted exploited existing geological formations in his large municipal park designs to create specific effects and to structure the overall landscape composition. Therefore, we see schist bedrock outcrops of Manhattan in Central Park, the terminal moraine glacial morphology of Long Island in Prospect Park, uh, all of which were designed with his uh, partner Wall uh, in 1858 and 1866, respectively. Or the Putting Stone conglomerate of Boston became the concept of Franklin Park which he created with his son, John Charles Olmsted in 1885. While working on large urban parks, Olmsted also developed the political rhetoric and economic justifications for larger national scenic reservations, thus setting the philosophical framework for the national park making in the United States. Subsequently, in 1865, Yosemite became the first national park of the United States, followed by Yellowstone in 1872. Olmsted and Wow prepared the state plan for Niagara Falls in 1887. He firmly believed that the government had a duty to protect the natural scene uh, that should be open to the public, that public aspect was always so strong in his profession. This notion set the base for the protection legislation in 1916. The critical portion of this bill was written by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr who continued his father's professional practice until 1950. Olsted Jr. was not only a great landscape architect, but also one of the pioneers in American urban planning. So this 
Olmsted firm, the firm of Olmsted, the senior, the junior, and John Olmsted, uh, is, is, is very important in the history of landscape architecture and urban planning in the States. What draws me to Olmsted's work is that he promotes nature in cities, regardless of how dense and complicated those cities are. His knowledge of the natural systems and the spatial and temporal perfection of his knowledge to the human scale is so noble that today we need his approach more than ever. His respect for site morphology, biodiversity, natural materials, and vernacular culture still sets the stage for placemaking in the 21st century. Olmsted work is relevant not only to Turkey, but all around the world, because as the implications of climate change became apparent, we need to make our cities more resilient. Larger parks are imperative in this endeavor for sequestering carbon, managing urban runoff, promoting well-being and social equity, mitigating the effects of sea level rise, pandemics, and many unforeseen consequences. Also, nature-sensitive city planning of Olmsted is imperative to create livable cities. So these are um, uh, some of the lessons I already knew, <laughs> but uh, I will take uh, with pleasure with me to Turkey. Thank you so much, um, Harriet. Um, we're going to move on now to, um, to your colleague, um, Dr. Banerjee. Welcome again, uh, uh, Yushi Ming, and we're so pleased to have you on our program today. Given, given your long-standing interest in the poetry of Emily Dickinson, what a wonderful opportunity you have to be based for the better part of a year in Amherst, where she spent her entire life. Um, I wanted to ask if this is um, in your first um, your first visit to Amherst, and um, also during your time in Amherst, what insights have you gained that may be new to you now um, in, into um, Dickinson's poetry? Well, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, and hi, everyone, and a very good afternoon to all of you. It's a beautiful day today, and I thank the entire team of World Boston, Mary, Josh, Jim, Sarah, Liam. I'm sorry if I'm missing out on any of you, but I truly mean everybody else who have worked very hard to put this together and having us here. Thanks also to all the members of the audience for coming to the program. This is surely a fantastic opportunity to talk to you about something that I always love talking about, that is all things Dickinson. Yes, Josh and Jim, this is my first visit to Amherst. And even before I landed doing Dickinson here, I stood astonished by the changing colors of the place. Fall had many shades and now so has spring. The coronavirus, I must say, has not been able to seize Amherst of its natural and vertiginous gleams and hues, even in the slightest possible manner. I think it's truly a blessing to be in a place that is not only exceedingly beautiful, but also carries a unique heritage of pulsatingly creative people whose legacies have come to define it in ways that seldom has any other place come to be defined by in current times. Any study on Emily Dickinson, so to speak, has an unavoidable need to be carried out in some very important places in the US. But yes, foremostly in Amherst, since a critical study of her oeuvre would need a significant dependence on first hand and more recent materials on her work and transcendental philosophy. I intended to carry out a thorough examination of the archival works available in diverse libraries in and around Amherst that house a significant corpus of Dickinson's work, including her fascicles, manuscripts, transcriptions, family and editorial correspondence, diaries, notes, photographs, and physical artifacts. I've chosen Amherst College since the institution constitutes a major repository for Dickinson's manuscripts and family papers. The Dickinson collection of the college, the largest of its class anywhere in the world, 
that records the creative work and personal life of Dickinson, spanning her lifetime from 1830 to 1886. The details about her family and friends and the early publication history of her work is also of immense help. And I thank a lot of people for supporting me all this while. Professor Karen Sanchez uh, Epler, my faculty associate at Amherst College, Professor Christopher Benfi, Mount Holyoke College, Lisa Stouffer, Director of the Grants Office, Amherst College, Susan Kimball, Head of Access Services and the Interim Director, Robert Ross Library, Amherst College, Mike Kelly, the Head of the Archives and Special Collections, Amherst College, Professor Prasanta Bomek, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, Professor J. Garfield, Smith College, Northampton, the Emily Dickinson Museum, Amherst, and the Jones Library, Amherst, and the list may continue. All of them have been extremely valuable to me, and had it not been for them, I wouldn't have been able to do my research in a way um, I, I have truly imagined doing before coming here. Hence, I was introduced to the finest materials and library holdings, so far as Dickinson scholarship is concerned, and these have certainly added multiple dimensions uh, to my thoughts on the poet's life and work. Thanks, um, um, Shaby. Um, if I may ask, um, what, as a scholar, what has um, drew, has drawn you to uh, Emily Dickinson for for a long time? Uh, as a scholar of Dickinson, um, how would you say that her work and her worldview differ from that of her American contemporaries? We're also writing in the mid 19th century. Exactly, Jim. That's a very good question, in fact. Let me begin by saying that one of the most significant questions raised by feminist literary criticism is the degree to which women writers may be said to possess a voice of their own. The question stands double fold when reduced to its essentials. Is there such a thing as women's language? And if there is, what is the relationship between that language and one which is brought by those who in one way or the other possess social and cultural power to create the language against which and within which women may be said to distinguish and differentiate their own? This differential element has posed a problem in explicitly underlining women's discourse within the context of a male-dominated system uh, of discourse. These are at this developed point in literary criticism, I mean, feminist literary criticism, rather obvious questions. Yet they are clearly related to my examination of the ways in which women intellectuals create and understand their own literary and intellectual performances, identifying the problem of the woman creator of literature. These issues have been my site for academic research for long now. Emily Dickinson, of course, constituted a portion of my doctoral work in which I've tried to consider the varied critical and hermeneutic aspects of her work alongside those of Elizabeth Barry Browning and Christina Rossetti. What I've particularly felt about their writing is that there remains a vista of possibility in their works by the end of which they have been able to transform their, their, their anxiety of such secluded art into a subversive genre that was able to give expression to their life and experience. In ways both direct and covert, they renounced their socially constructed roles and triumphed in carving out a paradigm shift in the way in which female authorship was estimated and received in the 19th century. Their poetry leaves for the subsequent generation of critiques of women's writing, such a rich plethora of signification regarding women's experiences, both in life and in art, that much of them perhaps have remained unexplored even to this day. The present work is the development of my prior attempts to consider Dickinson as a woman and a poet, but novel, for that matter, different in this study is the, the attempt to explore the element of a possible neo-Cadian slant 
that perspicaciously influences and shapes Dickinson's thought and her philosophy. Poetry for her lay invested with inconceivable possibilities of significance and signification. She revelled in the ecstatic madness of meanings, since to her, I quote from one of her lines, in which she says, much madness is divinest sense. With such a poetic vision, she transformed the materiality of the conceivable physical world in such a way as to foreground a metaphorical correlative for all seemingly mundane categories. Poetry is an art of the highest order and has to be, for this reason, semantically ambiguous and indeterminate. Hence, meaning always has to be in a state of flux rather than be in a condition of staticity. Dickinson's fort was perceivably to question the very notion of reality as is conventionally understood. Her poetic world would consist of alternative real objects and would, for this reason, nonetheless be real and breathing. Poetry was a quest for artistic excellence and she deeply delved in imagination to seek the appropriate philology to gain the hitherto elusive transcendental vision. The poet, by dint of her expression, attempts at discovering the mystery of human existence. And in this process it is her imagination that can lead to a revelation of the apotheosis she is endeavoring to achieve. Hence, she believes that prose, on the other hand, may bar the cognition of transcendence and drive her away uh, from, let's say, her divine goal of the lamps of poetic creativity by herself going out. The power, therefore, lies with the poet who reconceptualizes and recreates the objects of the universe through her consciousness and experience. Dickinson's autonomy of the poetic self has a palpable pertinence with Immanuel Kant's moral philosophy of the autonomy of practical reason. A human being exercises his free will in consonance with a universal moral law, since this individual will comes from rational agency. Dickinson perhaps was like Kant, intrigued with the question of, of the relation between subject and object, Kant's notion of the transcendent, that which goes beyond the boundaries of evidence, is also Dickinson's poetic concern. Epistemologically, Dickinson was influenced by the transcendental idealism envisaged by Kant, whereby he argues that the transcendental self emerges when the external environment is variedly perceived through the passage of time, as a result of which emerge again manifold perceptions or representations that together he calls as being a product of intuition. It is I'm assuming, mind that, sorry to interrupt, yeah. um, we just want to be aware of the time. Um, I would love to ask you a question about, uh, have Jim ask you a question about your book. Uh, this is super yeah. fascinating and then we're going to transition to Q&A, but I really want to know about your book. So I'm going to let Jim ask the third question there. Thank uh, you. You're doing great guys. Josh. Um, well, that was great. That was fascinating, Mushimi. Um, and um, just um, very briefly um, on two stuff, on two topics, and we'll go immediately to um, Q and A. Uh, first, um, um, I understand you're um, there. You will publish a manuscript based on your the work um, um, on Dickinson, and I'm just wondering if it might be a, available eventually in the United States, as as many of us would be interested to read it. And just very quickly, we, we thank you for making the effort to make the trip from um, Amherst to um, Boston in December um, to visit as part of the enrichment program Bunker Hill Community College. And um, I understand that India has similar post-secondary uh, education options as well. And in the very short time we have about, on this question, but about 30 seconds, if if you could, as an educator, compare the approaches to the community college model in India and in the United States. 
Absolutely, Jim. And thanks, Jos, for this, for cutting me short. Otherwise, I would have gone on and on. So, uh, so Jim, do you want me to answer both the questions at one same time, briefly? Yes, please. This, um, okay. The book, if it might be available here in the future, and then just just a, a brief thought on okay. community colleges in the two minutes. Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, I would love to publish my manuscript while I am in Amherst, but there are certain more interpretive dimensions that I would like to bring to my work for which I might re need some more time. And certainly once I'm done with my manuscript, it would be my heartiest pleasure to bring it out in the US, yes. I'm also very glad that there is a strong interest in Dickinson scholarship, perhaps in Boston and Amherst the most, and I hope my readers come to enjoy the essence of the work uh, once it sees the light of the day. And uh, of course, uh, but to, to uh, put it in a nutshell, this project would uh, attempt to explore this element of Kantianism that perspicaciously uh, influences and shapes Dickinson's thought. Our philosophy has with all certainty helped her to look at the German idealist philosophy in fact, to frame a mental critics, I'm trying to look at this critics that is felt to be at work in her writing. And in order to achieve this, the project aspires to look at her mind poems from the perspective of Kant's transcendental idealism and the moral philosophy of the autonomy of the human mind. So miles to go before I sleep. Yeah, and coming to the next question that you asked, Jim, I think uh, it's, it's about... Uh, the experience at Munger Hill Community College. And of course, it was, um, I would say, an extremely interesting program uh, that, that was conducted by uh, World Boston uh, on December 16. And it was wonderfully led by you and your team designated for the purpose of the visit to the college. And I'm sure it was of great interest to the others in the group as well. Uh, since we can have an experience of the unique community college system in America, the deliberations with both the program and the college officials were extremely enlightening. Besides the tour of the entire college, including the library and the language laboratory, also proved to be a very valuable piece of a hands-on experience that gave a comprehensive idea of the way in which the institution works. And you're right, in India, there are two distinct categories First, run by the government and the other run by private individuals or groups of such individuals. While the curricular structure remains the same in most cases, in both these systems, the cost of schooling um, often becomes a deciding factor that influences parents in, in, in selecting the kind of education to choose for their children. In government-aided schools, financial assistance can be offered by the governmental sources partially, while in privately run schools, the expenses are normally borne by the individual families. But there is no denying the fact that the expenses of private schooling significantly exceed its, its, its government-aided counterpart. And the positive marker to the existence of this difference is Parents can choose the kind of education they would like their children to have. But to respect the nature of governance of the schools, government-aided and privately run schools are required to be recognized by a concerned board of affiliation, for which it may be a necessary requisite for them to be a registered society, have their own buildings, get teachers trained for the students, staff in the government rules, charge fees and would be in consonance with these rules and so on. Interestingly also, some schools that have a philosophical or ideological orientation, the structure of their own as autonomous institutions, though the minimum requirements often need to be met. So I think uh, there are certain choices that parents are given to make, depending primarily on the quality of education imparted by the schools, before their children take for grad school and the nature of their financial capabilities. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Over to you, Josh. I know you've got some questions. Thanks, Tim. Uh, let me spotlight my stuff. Two guests. 
Okay, so um, now we're entering into the Q&A portion. And I want to thank you, uh, thank my panelists for the insightful discussion. And so we'll be taking some questions from the audience. Um, for those who may have joined the session late, a uh, reminder that mics and videos uh, are muted uh, and we'll be taking questions in two ways. So first you can click on the Q&A option on the toolbar below. You can also click on the raise hand um, option um, by clicking on participants and then the raise hand function in the uh, pop-up window that appears. Um, let's see. When you raise your hand, um, I will turn on your audio so you can ask a question um, using your voice. <laughs> All right, so we have a question from Karen Sanchez Epler. Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Feel free to ask. Ask away. Well, I'm um, so Musami. That was lovely to hear you presenting on on your Amherst Dickinson time, and I'm just so struck by thinking about Kant in this particular odd year, where in part you were getting to come to a place where um, she had lived and to be able to have this material immersion. And then with the pandemic now having um, isolation, which is also in some ways a Dickinson thing. Um, and yet the questions you're asking about or thinking about are, um, are, I guess I'd say anti-materialist questions, questions ab about mind. And so just thinking a little bit more about how it's mattered to think about these questions of mind, um, both it, with being able to be in this place and now also having some of that experience of staying home, which is very much a Dickinson material condition. Absolutely. Absolutely, Karen. So, so, so valid a point and absolute pleasure to have that question. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in the mire and confusion of everyday life, the, the uh, only faculty perhaps that remains in the dark or uh, at least very often is dangerously threatened to, is that of thinking. And something that we are doing in this current time the most perhaps, um, an act that in its intenser sense um, can be considered phenomenal to the act of philosophizing. Uh, the reality of this fact is that human beings are potential thinkers, but of course not all are actually so. In thinking, um, I guess is, is uh, that action that is made possible by a deeper seeing into things, objects and circumstances of the life that is lived every moment. Uh, and this, uh, th this very seeing into demands in its turn, a deeper perspicacity that gives birth to resounding questions um, about the truth of existence, both man and the world. Um, so this, this threefold pursuance of truth, that is uh, thinking, seeing, questioning, I think is an endless process that, that sometimes baffles the engaged mind and causes it to rise above the considerations of the material world, which only emerges as a secondary form of truth to it. Uh, and the insatiated mind then seeks more in the course of this endless phenomenon and tries to weave a kind of a, uh, I would say, a mental narrative that is often complex, at times ingenuous, and at other times very personal. So uh, the most elated form of such a mental activity would be transcendental. And, uh, and the mind can be said to achieve this height of transcendentality uh, when it is able to see things as pertaining to one whole that cannot be otherwise humanly envisaged in, it, in its totality. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, Musumi, I think we just, I want to get some uh, airtime for Hyrie. Um We have some questions coming in for her. Uh, I, I hope you answered that sufficiently. Thank you for getting me um, So, because Frederick Law Olmsted is one of my heroes, so I want to hear from Hyrie. Um Any thoughts about new building and landscaping efforts you've seen in 21st century Boston? Um, so what's, what's going up right now? What are your reaction to some of the new buildings that you've seen? Well, actually, I, I, I can listen to Masumi forever because I, 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 she's speaking so poetically and I can see her profession in her heart, in her appearance, everything. It's just so, so wonderful uh, listening to her and I would like to have a private conversation with her in the future um, and, and, and follow this friendship uh, for a long time. Uh, but speaking about uh, the, 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 the question, which is asked by, I don't know the name of my colleague, but thank you very much for the question. Um, although I'm not an expert about Boston, which is a very complicated and, 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 and very dynamic city of one of the U US cities uh, that I've been trying to understand for almost like eight months now. Uh, but as far as I can see, the, the, the main agenda is climate change and seawater uh, rise uh, in Boston and then the, the, the negative uh, implications coming with that climate change aspect. Um, like we have um, land making efforts which is coming uh, for like a couple of centuries since the beginning of the Boston city. Uh, and then all these lands, which was filled eventually during the time, during the history is under the threat of the sea, sea, sea level rise right now. So a lot of colleagues and, and the city planners are uh, making great effort to develop some ideas to mitigate some of these consequences. Um, and there are a lot of studies, the master plan works, actually you can check the web page of uh, SCAPE, for example, they develop a, a master plan for future, the Climate Resilience Boston master plan uh, that uh, they divided the downtown area, the South Boston and then East Boston, and, and then they have some uh, really nice graphics and explanations and how the city will conquer the, the challenges coming with that sea level rise. One of the main uh, policy, actually, or the strategy that they are proposing is establishing greener parks, much, much uh, uh, permeable urban context, which is getting much denser and less permeable these days. So permeability and capturing the carbon uh, as much as possible in the city and then managing the urban runoff uh, and the sea, sea water is, uh, is some of the projects that, that my colleagues are uh, paying great attention to and spending a lot of time. To. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I have a quick question for um, Dr. Banerjee. Um, we have Jun Hwan Kim, who's actually also a Fulbright scholar. Um, he's asking, uh, he says, Dr. Banerjee, thank you for your wonderful talk. Any modern and or contemporary Indian fem uh, female poets influenced by fe uh, Emily Dickinson? Uh, we was hoping you could name a few. We're, we're putting you on the spot here. Okay, so um, uh, can we go over the question once more, Josh? Uh, uh, sure. Any... Sorry, I wasn't clear. Uh, he was wondering if there is any modern or contemporary Indian female poets that have been influenced by Emily Dickinson. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, there have been poets who have uh, written under the influence of Emily Dickinson, but uh, I'm afraid she is a kind of a poet who has you know, uh, being tremendously influential, but at the same time, you know, uh, inimitably revolutionary in the sense that, I mean, uh, it, it, it was and still is uh, extremely difficult to imitate the style uh, of Dickinson. There have been modern poets who have uh, attempted uh, such, such a kind of, um, uh, you know, experimental poetic, but uh, I think hers was a kind of a romantic vocabulary of beauty and sublime that that was not merely experimental, but was shockingly new. So um, I guess there have been uh, theoretical and philosophical um, influences, uh, but um, I don't uh, 
quite very much, if I'm not wrong, uh, see poetry around uh, these days that 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 could be said to have been either imitated by Dickinson or um, has been written under the influence of Dickinson. So, uh, you know, her, her uh, genre of mental poetics and mental experimentalism uh, can have, again, a deep uh, influence on many modern poets. Yes. Um, great. Thank you so much. I was just going to ask, you know, it's, we've been holding a lot of these uh, virtual events and I feel like it's, this is such a unique time um, that we're in isolation. And I wanted to ask both of you, if you could just take a minute to talk a little bit about um, how your countries are responding to the latest crisis. How, how are you doing? How is your family? Um, and, you know, just talk to us a little bit about being here in Boston and how you're keeping in touch and, and how you're holding up. Um, I'll start with Dr. Hyrie, um, uh, Dr. Tunke. Sure, thank, thank you. Well, uh, so, so, so far we are doing fine. I came to Boston with my son and his school is off, of course, and he's doing like home schooling at home and I do most of my work uh, at home, um, but, but very productive uh, and then probably busier than ever because <laughs> now that the Zoom is enabling uh, to work in longer hours or any time of the day, uh, so it's more work <laughs> on our side, but I feel that it's more connected work now. Uh, I can meet with my colleague in Brazil, which I was chairing an office in Harvard and he had to go back home due to COVID. Now I'm connecting Brazil at the same time, one hour later, I am in Japan talking to my Japanese colleague. And while I am running my firm in Istanbul during the day, many, many <laughs> talks with PP times and also interacting with my colleagues in Boston. So it's definitely a much smaller work that we can share much faster. Um, and and, and it it's never meets the, 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 the same satisfaction of the multi-sensory experiences that we are having with our colleagues or friends. But still, uh, I think it's, it's a way of communicating and, uh, and then we uh, adapted very well. Uh, in terms of Turkey, um, uh, actually, it, it was the same time, like in Boston, the mid-March, we, we, everything is closed and it's the same thing for Turkey. And, 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 and then they had the state of emergency for the first few weeks and nobody was able to get out of their home. And then uh, they started the... Um, the tests immediately, they, they provide a test for free for a lot of people, for many people. So I think that helped uh, to control the spread of the disease. And, and, and then the, the numbers are getting much better these days. And then starting from next week, the, the government has uh, announced the, the, the program to get back to normal life. And then they are eventually uh, opening this, the schools and eventually opening the, the commercial activities. So things are getting much better. Uh, so now that the, the, the May is almost over, we are ready to start the summer. The sun is shining. So we are very much hopeful that we will have much better summer. Uh, yeah. Of course. For so. all of us, all over the yeah. world. <laughs> I hope the best for all of us. Yeah, maybe enjoy a uh, Olmsted Park. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Dr. Banerjee, um, we, we don't have so much time. I want to give you a chance, though, and then I'll have my closing remarks. And uh, yeah, so how are, how are things going? Yeah, um, I mean, it has been strange. Uh, though the present COVID times uh, have been challenging to a considerable extent for all of us, uh, I think the experience also has been nonetheless unique. Uh, we've been able to come out with a greater resilience, strength of mind, and the willingness to act with agency in these most demanding times. Uh, process of self-discovery for me and uh, no other way could have really made me realize the inner strength that has, that has really seen me through these baffling and mysterious moments of time. And moreover, I, I, I found a lot of time for my thinking and writing. So I'm trying to kind of derive the best from these troubled times uh, since it's perhaps time that we learn a lot about our lives, our societies, our nations, and the entire world, so to speak, and uh, what we do to contribute 
not only to the betterments of the lives of our fellow citizens, but to the environment at large. And uh, in India, the government is making substantial attempts to fight the COVID uh, times in varied ways, being one of the oldest inhabited regions of the planet. It is a nation of almost 138 crores now, if I'm not mistaken. And for this reason, what is extremely worrying is that uh, the number of affected cases is on the rise. And the country has uh, uh, presently witnessed not only a sharp increase uh, in infectivity, but also an alarming tendency towards reaching the tipping point. The nation is uh, under lockdown currently, and travel by air, rail, and road is strictly prohibited. Uh, mm -hmm. The states are doing a great job, nonetheless, uh, by trying to cooperate with the government to maximum and, and, and fight the pandemic collaboratively. I hope we soon get over these unprecedented times uh, and normalcy is, uh, is, is restored everywhere. And so far as- I, I have to cut you off right there. Sorry, we're at two o'clock. Thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee. Um, yes. I'm gonna have some, um, the last word as it were. Um, so it seems we've run out of time for questions. Uh, I see there are a few more in the Q&A and I'm very sorry that we didn't get to them. Uh, but we want to respect everyone's schedules and wrap up within the hour uh, or close to it. Um, we'll be sending out a link to a recording of this webinar uh, session posted on YouTube and a follow-up email very soon. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, our speakers for joining us on this sunny day. It was a pleasure to hear your insights and uh, we would you know, deeply thank you for helping create an international exchange experience for this audience. Um, thank you to all who tuned in. Uh, we appreciate your own call to citizen diplomacy during this challenging time and hope that you will tune in to our virtual webinar series. Uh, we plan to run an event approximately every Tuesday. Uh, next week, we'll feature culinary diplomacy with another one of our Fulbright Scholar stars from India. Um, that will take place at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, March 26th. On the other side of programming at World Boston, we'll be starting an online world affairs trivia competition this Thursday, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, May 21st for the following four weeks, every Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Um, each, each week's theme will be different, and this Thursday will be Mexico. Um, registration is now open, so reserve your spot on our website, and we hope that we, you join us. Finally, uh, please stay tuned uh, on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and sign up for our newsletters to stay informed um, if you haven't already. Uh, you can do that on our website, worldboston.org. Um, your friends at World Boston wish you all to remain in good health and in good spirits. Uh, take care. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.